through Jesus' mission, we find our purpose for the journey. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus gives us an example through baptism. He restores hope to the hurting. He invites others along and prepares us to go to the sons and daughters of God. His mission is our mission. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you. Glad that you're here. For those of you joining online, welcome. I'm glad that you're joining us as well. I'm going to invite all of you, please, to take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to Luke's gospel in the fourth chapter. Luke's the f- third book of the New Testament. So if you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, you'll find it. If you go to John, you'll go a little too far, but hopefully you'll find it there in your Bible or your device, or it'll be on the screen behind me here when we read it in just a moment. Luke 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 16. I'm going to read down through verse 22. Uh, Before you get too cozy in your seat from just sitting down, I'm going to invite you to stand with me again in honor of God's word. And let's read these verses together. So you follow along with me either on the screen or in your Bible while I read aloud. Luke 4, beginning with verse 16. He, as Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Real quick parentheses here. When you stand up and honor the scriptures, you're coming from a long, great tradition. All through the Old Testament, and Jesus is now standing, honoring the scriptures. Verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus, would you... Stir in us a conviction or a resolve or a continuation to or burden or all the above for our life and life purpose and mission be the same as yours. Show show us where we're off track individually and as a church and put us on your track. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Do you have a life verse? Or do you know someone who does have a life verse? It's okay if you don't. It's not like it's a bad thing if you don't have a life verse. Uh, maybe you've had one. Maybe there, If you're wondering, okay, what is a life verse? It's a, it's a verse that maybe God's given you, if you will. Maybe you were reading your Bible one day and God just used it to speak to you. Or you have a verse that really encourages you or challenges you or pushes you or... There's some, there's some verse in the scripture that uh, just explains you. You can tell a lot about a person by their life verse. It's a verse that they kind of just put over their life and, and operate accordingly. Luke tells us that when Jesus began his ministry, about 30-year-old single guy, 30-year-old single Jewish guy, who was the guest speaker for the day at his home church in Nazareth. We don't know if the regular rabbi was out of town But Jesus was the guest speaker for the day. I don't know if he woke up a little nervous. I mean, he's the son of God. But perhaps he woke up, showered, trimmed his beard, threw some bagels in the toaster, got some cream cheese out of the fridge, maybe scrambled some eggs, and then threw some coffee in a travel mug as he headed out the door to Nazareth. I don't know. 
But we know he got to church that day on the Sabbath, and he was the guy who was supposed to preach. He was the, the speaker for the day, the visiting rabbi. And it just so happened to be Isaiah 61 day. Some scholars say he turned to Isaiah 61. Other scholars say this synagogue was probably going through the book of Isaiah and they just happened to be in Isaiah 61. Either way, it just happened to be Jesus' life verse, his passage. I think he meant it, whether he turned there or not. But they turned, he, he turned to this passage, and it's Jesus' life verse, and it's from Isaiah 61, and it's, and it's the part in the book of Isaiah when, when, when God told Isaiah to tell his people that there's hope coming. They, when, 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 when Isaiah was sent to the nation of Israel, they were exiles in Babylon, been there for dec decades, and God said, Isaiah, when you get to chapter 61, or whenever he wrote his prophecy and spoke his prophecy, I want you to tell them that hope is coming, that I'm sending my servant, and I'm going to anoint him with my spirit, and everything's going to be reversed. The effects of the fall are going to be reversed. This, this whole Babylon captivity, you're going to be set free, and everything is going to be incredible. As a matter of fact, you can go ahead ahead and tell them that the year of the Lord's favor, the era of God's favor on mankind is coming. And that's the passage where Jesus happened to be in that day. And so Jewish synagogue, men sat on one side, women sat on the other. They called Jesus up, perhaps as he's walking up to the stage, he's wiping his beard, make sure there's no cream cheese. They hand him the scroll. He opens it to Isaiah 61, and here's the text that he reads. It's verses 1, 2, and 3 from Isaiah 61. You can see it there in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. He reads, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now Luke tells us that he rolled the scroll up and he handed it back to the attendant. If it were me, now Jesus isn't near as sassy or as arrogant as prideful of me. If it were me, I would have waited just a minute until I said what I'm going to say next. Then I would have done the ultimate scroll drop. But Jesus isn't near as sassy as I am. But Luke tells us that there's tension in the room. Every eye was on him. You got to wonder if Mary was sitting in the back. It's my son, he's preaching. You could cut it with a knife. You could hear a feather hit the ground. Everybody's thinking, what's this hometown boy going to say? Is he going to exegete the passage rightly? Is he going to get inside the Isaiah's head and help us understand what Isaiah meant when he said it? Or is he going to blow his one chance to preach here at the synagogue? What's he going to say? And Isaiah says, or excuse me, Luke says that Jesus looked at everybody. And he gave a one-verse sermon. Now, don't get your hopes up, because that just ain't going to happen here. But he gave a one-sentence sermon. And here's what he says. Today, in your hearing, that scripture from Isaiah has been fulfilled. I wish I could have been in the room where people like, was Mary, where people like, he was saying that he himself was the fulfillment of the Isaiah prophecy, not an event, a person. That means if what he says is true, if what Jesus said really happened, and I believe it did, he's either Lord or he's a lunatic. He either is the fulfillment or he's a madman. If what Jesus said is true, that he was the fulfillment, he was saying, I am God's hope for the world. 
I am God's hope for the nation of Israel. I came to preach the good news, to set the captives free, to release those who are oppressed, to give those who are blind eyes to see, and to let everybody know that the year of the Lord is here. The era of God's favor upon man is here in Jesus. That's a pretty big statement. I believe it's Jesus' life verse. and You can tell a lot about a person by their life verse. If someone were to say to you, what's your Jesus like? What's Jesus like? We're at a good passage. You can mark in your margins if you want or in your notes. What is Jesus like? He tells us. And there are five behaviors, five actions, five descriptions given in these verses. You caught them. I've said them several times already. He says, here's what the Spirit of God has sent me on earth to do, to preach good news to the poor, to release, release those who are in captivity, to, to give those who are blind eyes to see, to set free those who are oppressed, and then to declare, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So if someone were to say to you, what's your Jesus like? You're saying, he, he preaches good news and heals people. He proclaims the gospel, the good news of salvation for mankind, and he comes along people, and he, he, he's apathetic, and he, he helps them, and he ministers to them. That's what my Jesus is like. He sees those in captivity, and he aches. He sees those who are oppressed, and he hurts. He sees those that are blind and wants to do something about it. That's what my Jesus is like. And Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, is the one who says, hey, I am God's message to the world, saying God is favorable on you. That's what Jesus is like. You can tell a lot about a person from their life verse. You ask the question, well, did Jesus do this? Say, this is what he came to do. He said this at the beginning of his ministry. Did Jesus do these things? I encourage you to take some time this year and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know what you're going to find Jesus doing? These things. 99% 99 times, I didn't count them, I looked this up. 99 times you see Jesus both preaching truth and healing. A few times he just heals without any proclamation. About 50, he proclaims truth without healing. But 99 times, that's right at 100, us Baptists would say it's about 300. But 99 times He both proclaims good news and heals. So he did it. Here's what I came to do, and I'm going to do it. And that's what he did in his earthly ministry. And you ask me, is this metaphorical or is this real? Is this this all spiritual or is this physical too? And my answer is yes. Did Jesus mean... He's going to bring, preach good news to those who are poor in spirit? Yes. Does he also mean that he's going to preach good news to those who are poor and in poverty? Yes. Is he going to set free those who are in spiritual captivity? Yes. Is he going, does he want the, uh, the kingdom of God, uh, the Christians, to be about doing what we can to release those who are in captivity? Yes. Does he want to turn uh, those who are walking in blindness spiritually and give them eyes to see? Yes. Does he want us to go into the world and the structures and the systems that are oppressive and help people see what can be done to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth? Yes. On and on and on and on. Does he mean spiritual? Does he mean physical? Yes. You cannot read this verse. You cannot read the gospels without saying yes. He means both spiritual and physical, which is why BT dubs, which means by the way, I love our mission statement. I love our mission statement. Engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. If you're wondering if my challenge to you is biblical or not, I encourage you to lay that over Luke 4, 18 and 19. Or lay Luke 4, 18 and 19 on top of the mission statement. Do we engage people's heads and hearts? Yes. Do we engage people's physical hurts? Yes. We engage the whole person because we believe the gospel speaks to the whole person anywhere, anytime, with anybody. 
You know that your soul has a body, right? And your body has a soul. And when Jesus came up out of the tomb, it wasn't just a soul. He came out with a body. And we're told that when the consummation of all things happens and Jesus returns, not just our souls will come, but our bodies will meet with our souls. And both matter. So Jesus came to do these things. Now the question is, what is Jesus doing right now? Did he stop? I believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the last time I checked, Jesus died, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And you read that first part in Acts where he ascended into heaven. You know what happened a couple days later? He sent his spirit to live inside who? The church. And if you read the book of Acts, guess what the church is doing? Proclaiming good news to the poor. Releasing the captive. Helping those who are blind have eyes to see. Setting free those who are oppressed. And proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. You know what I believe Jesus is doing now? Same thing. Here's the question. Is Jesus' mission yours? <laughs> is what Jesus up to right now what your passion is? Well, it's going to look a million different ways. But is your life mission, is your life verse, is your purpose in life what Jesus is about now? Because I believe he's moving now, he's working now, and our job is simply to say, okay, God, how have you wired me? Where have you put me? What are you doing? How are you working? And what are you doing? How have you called me to join you in what you're doing? That's what, that's what he's inviting us to. And by the way, I love where God has situated the building at the church at West Franklin. Have you noticed where, where God has, uh, has situated? Well, of course you have, you're sitting in it. But what I mean is, have you noticed where we are in relation to the city of Franklin? If you, this way, if you go this way about a half, three-quarter, a mile that way, you're going to be inundated with generational poverty. People that have grown up in poverty and can't break the cycle. I believe it can be broken, but it's very, 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 very hard. You go that way, you're going you're gonna to find it. If you, yeah, a mile and a half, or about a, about a half mile to a mile. If you go a mile, mile and a half that way, we're going to find some of the wealthiest people in North America. Isn't that incredible? Can you imagine? God has placed us in a perfect spot to ask the question, what are you doing? And what, how have you called me to join you? Because whether you're one of the wealthiest in North America or whether you can't, you can't afford a, a box of cereal, all of us in some way, shape, or fashion are oppressed, are in captivity, are blind and can't see, and we're poor, we need good news. It plays out in a myriad of ways, and he's placed us right here to say, okay, Jesus, I can throw a rock somewhere, and you're going to be working. You're calling me to join you in what you're doing. The question is, are we looking? Is his mission our mission? Or are we getting more in a wad about what the protocols are for this stupid COVID thing? And yeah, it's stupid. I hate it. Wish it'd go away. But it's so fascinating, isn't it, how our passion can go from where it should be and be focused on something else just like that. I can't snap well with my left hand. I did something really dumb Wednesday night. Big time dumb. It was big. Quote Barney Five, big. It was bad. After the dust settled from what happened at the Capitol, those horrific things that we saw on our televisions Wednesday, and I think, and I believe, and I thought everything was beginning to calm down there for a little bit. I did something really dumb. <clears throat> I got on social media. I love social media. I use social media, but there are times you shouldn't. And that was one of those times. 
I knew I shouldn't. I used the big three too, Facebook, Instagram, and the Twitter. All three of them. And I kept telling myself, stop, stop. You're just going to get mad and waste time. But I kept going. And y'all quit looking at me and judging me because you do it too. But I was just a scroll and I got mad at some people. People are idiots. You know that? And then, and then I got sad because people were posting this stuff. I was like, you dumb person. And then, then I, there's a couple of times I said amen because I'm like, yeah, finally, somebody's smart. Posted something, I, I like, amen to that. But then I kept going. I told you it wasn't smart. Big mistake. But you know, I noticed something. Some well-meaning people would post this. They'd put pictures of what they saw. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of North Americans in Washington, D.C. And then they would say, this isn't who we are. And I get it. That was a minuscule percentage of our population, praise the Lord. That we see those images in the actual uh, capital doing what they did. But it was very difficult for me to see images of thousands of North Americans there at the Capitol and then somebody say, hey, this isn't who we are. In one sense, sure, it's not. It's not the majority of North America. But aren't we defined by what we do? So it got me thinking this. We say a lot, we engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. But is there any evidence out there that that's who we are? It's a wonderful statement. But if the Tennessean stuck a microphone in my mouth and said, hey, Pastor Matt, what's your church about? And I said, we exist to engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody. And an investigator came to follow up to see if that was true, what I said we are. I wonder what they'd find. What did your heart do Wednesday night when you turned off the news? What stirred your heart? What stirred you up on Wednesday night? Or my, my mama would say it. What got you in a wad Wednesday night? I could list a lot of questions right now. When will we? Look at what we saw and say, what an opportunity you've given me to preach the gospel in this world. You do know, don't you? The darkness shines, the light shines brightest in the dark. We have an opportunity to make Jesus known at an incredible time when everybody's looking for a Savior. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. What happens in your heart when you see those things? Tomorrow night's the national championship game college football. For many of you, you'll be thrilled. It's the last college football game of the year. For many, like myself, I'll be in mourning for a month. One of my children said this week that they're going to pull for Alabama. Uh, they slept, they've been sleeping outside for the week. Uh, I don't know if I'll let them back in or not. But it reminded me of a time In 1992, I was 15 years of age, and Alabama was playing Miami in the national championship, because Alabama always plays in the national championship. I went to Auburn, for those of you wondering why I'm the way I am. 
And I remember thinking, because they were playing Miami, and I hate Miami too. Always hated Miami. And I thought, you know, I'm going to cheer for Alabama this year. I didn't tell my dad that, but I said, you know, I'm going to cheer for Alabama this year. I'm going to do it. Alabama came out on the field. No, let me reverse that. Miami came out on the field. I was like, oh, okay. Seconds later, Alabama comes out on the field. And I kid you not, I immediately became the biggest Miami Hurricane fan that ever walked the earth. I could not help it. It just happened. So I'm praying that happens to my boy there tomorrow night. Why do I tell you that? A lot can be revealed about your heart when you see things. A lot can be revealed about the gospel and your heart when you see things. If your desire is to express vitriol on social media as opposed to a new resolve to take the gospel to North America, let's let's beg God to help us change. Is your mission the mission of Jesus Christ? I'm going to invite Josh Lynn to come back on stage for just a moment because I asked him, he's our missions minister, you saw him earlier, I asked him if he would give us a quick list of ways we, some of you can immediately get involved in Franklin right now. This isn't exhaustive, this is just a way. If you're thinking, okay, I want to, God's calling me to do something, I want to do something, I want to give you handles, I want to give you an on-ramp before we leave with some ways to do it. So we brought him on staff. We pay him in order to be a resource to you, to connect you to ministries, to equip you for gospel ministry. He's doing a fantastic job, and I want him to be more involved in all of our lives. So, Josh, give us a, give us a quick rundown of some ways we can begin, begin it, to be involved this week. Yeah, the, the reason that I'm here, the reason I'm called to be the missions minister at the church at West Franklin is because what God is calling me in my life to do is to connect with you to be a part of your life, to equip you for what God is putting on your heart, the mission that he's putting on your heart to make much of Jesus in our community and around the world. I mean, <clears throat> like Matt said, just list a few of these things off. We're going to have them on the screen in front of you. We have amazing partners that we work with all throughout our community, places like New Hope Academy that's bringing racial unity and economic unity between families in Franklin with a Christ-centered mission and teaching focus. We have places like Mercy Community Healthcare that's working to bring healthcare to, to those who don't have access to it, to the poor, to the impoverished, and sharing the gospel while they do it. We work with Franktown Open Hearts, which works with school-aged children to help give them a hope and a vision for their future, but to also communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ with each and every kid who comes through their doors. We work with Begin a New that happens downtown in Franklin, where we're teaching ESL classes, we're teaching GED classes, we're teaching computer literacy classes, all to share the gospel with the nations who are here in Franklin. There's a pregnancy center in Columbia, Tennessee that comes all the way to Hard Bargain to work with women who, who are in crisis pregnancies. We have ministries born out of this church working with recovery homes for men and women in downtown Franklin a block away from the square. We have men and women who go out and pick people up in food deserts in our community and take them to get groceries. There are a million different ways for you to be a light for Jesus Christ in our community, a million different things for you to plug into. And if none of these things are speaking to your heart, God has something else for you. And it's my job, my privilege, and my joy to come alongside you, help you find out what that is, and take the next steps for it. So let me encourage you, Right now, before you go to lunch, before you go to brunch, before you close down the browser that you're watching this, this service on, take out your phone, take out your computer. This is my cell phone number, 615-735-7681. Before you go on to the next thing, send me a message. Call me. Email me, jlynn at westfranklinchurch.com. Our mission is to engage the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere, anytime, with anybody but we can't do that at all if we don't start somewhere, sometime, with somebody, with you. So come, send me a message. You don't have to have it figured out what you want to do. You don't have to figure out what God's mission for you is right now. But take the first step. 
looking forward to it. Thank you, Josh. We don't have to wonder if Jesus was successful his first sermon. I don't know if it's the first sermon, but the sermon that was recorded here in Luke 4. Luke tells us that they were all speaking well of him and amazed by his gracious words that came from his mouth. So we know there was some, whoa, <laughs> hometown boy just called himself the Messiah. And I do imagine Mary, if she was there, just beaming. But then he uses this word that I don't like here. He says, yet they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? I hate that word, yet. You know why? Because I say it all the time. Oh, that was a great sermon. Yet I'm not going to do anything. That was a great podcast. Yet I've got this going on. That was an incredible lesson. Thank you. Yet who cares? Luke goes on to tell us that Jesus said a little bit more and then they wanted to throw him off a cliff. Not a great first day. You know why? Because he actually wanted them to do something different. Because he got in their faces and said, there's some stuff happening. So before you get to your car and before the yet word comes, would you obey what the Spirit's calling you to do? I pray that our mission is the same as the Lord Jesus. May that be the case, Jesus. Amen. For those of you online, thank you for joining us. Thrilled that you did join us. God bless you. Have a great day.